name is Deborah van den Branden, and I'm the Senior Economic Policy Officer at the Consulate General of the Netherlands in San Francisco. I'm very excited to have you all here today uh, for this uh, virtual roundtable and now talks in Phoenix. Uh, and we'll have, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce our Consul General Herbert Kunst, who will be providing the opening word. So Herbert, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Deborah, and a good morning to uh, all our friends in Arizona. Of course, good morning, of good afternoon to our friends in the Netherlands. It's great that we have the opportunity for a virtual roundtable to connect Phoenix and the Netherlands again. Of course, we'd love to be present in Arizona, but due to COVID, that was not possible. So I think it's a good opportunity, a second best, to do a virtual roundtable. And I think we have something to celebrate, actually, because I can officially announce today that we have a, a new honorary consul in Phoenix for the state of Arizona, Odette Bakker. You will have a chance to get to know her a bit later because she is part of our program. And of course, uh, I would real, really like to thank Siebe van der Zee, who has sort of for 28 years served the country of the Netherlands in Arizona as well. And Siebe, of course, you deserve a great farewell party, but that wasn't possible either. But we'll come back for you, of course, and celebrate the inauguration of our new honorary consul, Odette Bakker. And a session like this, of course, and you know that, can only come together when you have great partners. And we do have great partners in Phoenix. We have the mayor's office and we have the team of GPAC. And they're always our friends. And I think they'll reach out to every entrepreneur out of the Netherlands to help them make the next steps. And you know, I think we have had our pop-up consulates in Arizona. Uh, we noticed it is really an interesting hub for Dutch trade. Uh, we definitely see opportunities, for example, in the field of um, energy, life science and health. We have had a very successful uh, program for a global scale-up uh, program organized by our former co uh, honorary consul, Marianne van der Steen of the University of Limburg, right at campus. And uh, a part of that, we see that Arizona is just like the Netherlands, very much focused on the circular economy. There's even an incubator in this field. So I think, well, remember, Phoenix is the fifth biggest city in the US and we are, the Netherlands, the sixth most important market to Arizona. We are great, great partners. And I think this opportunity today, this round table, is the ideal moment to set next steps, to reconnect and to think maybe about a joint strategic agenda. How could we really sort of help each other through this difficult COVID time and provide opportunities for entrepreneurs to really profit and, and blossom? And I think that's, of course, the task of the consulate in San Francisco, with the great help of Deborah and my colleague, Deputy uh, Consul General Vincent Storymans, who is also joining us. But of course, we couldn't do it without our friends in Arizona. First and foremost, wishing all the best to our new honorary consul, Odette Bakker. But of course, thanking all the friends who are always around to help the Netherlands set next steps. And I'm pretty sure we have some wonderful entrepreneurs in our panel today that they, these uh, uh, colleagues will be helpful for the Dutch entrepreneurs. And maybe final word, in the end, we have a breakout room. And this is just, I think, an ideal moment to have a very informal chat and maybe think about opportunities to share and uh, new plans to make. So Deborah, I hand over to you and I wish you a very fruitful conversation today. Thank you so much for your preparation, Deborah. Thank you so much, Gerbert, um, and welcome everyone again um, on this interactive roundtable. We've decided for this format so you can really also share your own experiences, ask your questions, mute and unmute yourselves during the Q&A parts. And uh, before diving in, I'll be happy to uh, give you a brief overview of today's flow. Uh, we will start with um, some um, testimonials of um, very seasoned and well-experienced uh, Dutch entrepreneurs in Arizona who will be sharing um, their experiences so far, what has worked for them, what their tips and tricks are, but also how they've seen the landscape evolve and where they see opportunities for growth. Um, after that, uh, Odette Bakker, our very new honorary consul, will be moderating a dialogue, a policy dialogue, with um, Chris Mackey and with Chris Camacho from um, the economic uh, team uh, of the city of Phoenix and GPEC um, together. And after that, we will um, have a, a social mixer where we will be uh, split into breakout rooms and we will be able to also interact together to also formulate points of the agenda that we see that we want to continue uh, for the year to come. Um, 
before diving in, um, Herbert unfortunately has to leave us at this point due to um, an emergency meeting. But thank you so much, Herbert, for the opening word. Um, and he will definitely um, remain posted and in the loop. Also on this call, maybe before um, starting it off, maybe Vincent, I can give you the word very briefly and you can also introduce yourself. Uh, Vincent Sturimans is our deputy consul and he'll be also here uh, for the social part of the mixer. So maybe Vincent? Good morning, uh, Deborah, and good morning participants. Thank you so much. Um, I've been to, I've had the pleasure of, of visiting uh, Arizona several times, also uh, from my previous posting at the Dutch Embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. So very uh, happy to see Siebe Frank Odette. Congratulations to the latter. And I know there is uh, so much potential in the state of Arizona. Uh, wonderful people. So I very much look forward to this, this discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Vincent. Then without any further ado, let's kick it off and let's start with the first part of today's program. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce uh, the following three entrepreneurs today. Uh, Martin Pirik, uh, he's the managing partner and CEO at Kite Rocket. Then we have Siebe van der Zee, who is the president of van der Zee and Associates, well-known serial entrepreneur, and most of you also know him as our previous honorary, uh, honorary consul. Thank you so much for your service, Siebe. And then last but definitely not least, we have Frank Mayes around the table, president at Luchter Global LLC, and also serial entrepreneur. I'd like to ask you all to mute yourselves. That is not the case at this point because I hear some echo. Thank you. So without um, any further ado, maybe um, the first question, we'd love to hear a bit more about you, not only um, about um, your, your entrepreneurial journey in general, but more so what has your experience been like to set up your business in Arizona? And um, what was the main draw to Arizona and what has worked well uh, for you um, in, that re in, in that regard. And I'll kick it off with uh, Martin, because Martin, I know that you have quite uh, an interesting story because um, you didn't really start initially in Arizona, if, if I'm correct. That's correct. And I think, yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Um, and Odette, uh, again, uh, congratulations on your appointment. And Siba, thank you for the many years of friendship as well as serving as our Honorary Consul uh, uh, prior to Odette's new uh, appointment. Um, I know we have limited amount of time, so I'll keep it short. I indeed, I, I've been in the U.S. for uh, for 23 years, born and raised in the Netherlands, but came out to Arizona to actually go to school to uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, but after that, spent about 10 years working in Silicon Valley um, in the marketing agencies and in the semiconductor um, technology space mostly. Um, and, uh, and after almost a decade, actually uh, decided to move back to Phoenix to start my own business. Um, and the real reason was because um, the business climate in, in Phoenix just turned out to be a, a really good uh, setting for uh, younger entrepreneurs to get started um, for many reasons. Um, obviously, cost of living in Arizona is, is much lower than Silicon Valley. Um, quality of life is very high here. There's great access to talent. Um, there's great access to resources. Um, you know, GPEC and uh, City of Phoenix and many others around here. Uh, we've got great schools, ASU, um, U of A, Grand Canyon University. Um, there is University of Phoenix, so many talent pools as well. Uh, and for small entrepreneurs, that's really important because uh, when you uh, when you come from Silicon Valley and you have to compete for talent with the Googles and the LinkedIn's of the world, uh, it's very hard to find good talent at a reasonable um, cost and then to maintain or keep them until uh, you know until they get scalped away by some of these bigger tech companies that are very interesting to uh, to younger talent. Um, so I've been very uh, fortunate that I had had some experience being in Arizona. And after 10 years, decided to pack up the family, go over back to Arizona, set up my business. And um, I wish I'd known more than, uh, than I know now of all the resources that are actually available in Phoenix and uh, greater Phoenix and state of Arizona. Um, so, you know, if, if I were to ever um, 
uh, do it again, I would certainly uh, reach out to many of those organizations. But also the business community um, in Arizona in Phoenix is very open. The opportunity for anyone, even from the outside, to become part of the business community uh, and, to, uh, and to really get integrated is, uh, is it's very open and very uh, welcoming. Um, and so it's, it's always been a really great experience to, uh, to be able to come into a state that welcomes uh, entrepreneurs, young businesses. And there's not, uh, there's not a huge amount of, uh, of Arizona grown businesses compared to uh, California. But, um, but with the shift in, uh, in the cost of living, the cost of doing business, the talent available, and also um, the ability to be very close to some of these big economic centers, both in LA and San Francisco, makes Arizona an incredibly, um, uh, incredibly welcoming place. And it has all the, uh, the connections to be in Arizona, from Arizona to California within an hour or two hours. And so uh, it really provided the right uh, format for me to do so. Thank you, Martin. I'd like to add to that, of course, uh, it's located right next to California, but also right next to Mexico. So a location ideal also for international entrepreneurs to do business. Uh, plus, we also see here in Silicon Valley, actually, a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself moving away to regions. Um, and among those, are Arizona and the greater Phoenix uh, region is definitely uh, of interest. So uh, I'm really excited personally to also see how that's going to develop further. And especially also now that the landscape is also shifting dra drastically due to uh, COVID-19 and its implications. A lot of people that are um, terminating their leases here in the city and that are moving actually uh, to other states. So we'll see what that's gonna bring. Uh, but then um, I know that Siebe, you've been in uh, Arizona for a long time now. How have you uh, seen the business landscape evolve and what was it like for you to set up your business um, and what learnings can you share? Well, thank you. And, and again, good, mor good morning. I see a lot of familiar faces and to my friends in Holland, goedemiddag. By the end of this program, we can all pronounce that, I'm sure. Uh, and Odette, congrats. Um, wonderful. So as far as my experience, I came to Arizona well over 30 years ago. I went to uh, Thunderbird School of Global Management. And um, after that, I lived in four countries on three continents. But there was something always that intrigued me about Arizona. And it comes down to actually two words, growth and opportunity. It is amazing to see for people who have not been to Arizona that since the inception of the state of Arizona, only in 1912, how this state has developed and grown and the end is not in sight. So for Dutch companies who haven't been here yet, be aware of what Arizona has to offer. Like Martijn said, next to California, a huge marketplace, but here, much lower cost of doing business. California is very accessible. You drive you know, an hour and you're in Los Angeles or you fly to San Francisco and, you know, an hour and, and 45 minutes or so. Growth and opportunities. We have a number of Dutch companies here and I wanna categorize it a little bit. We have some major Dutch manufacturers here, uh, ASM International, ASML, NXP, Volters Kluwer, Kluwer, whatever way we want to pronounce it, um, Philips. Philips is active here and it looks like they want to expand their operations here in Arizona. So those are the big companies from the Netherlands. If you look at the next group, group would be the Dutch entrepreneurs. And actually on the screen, I see several faces of Dutch entrepreneurs who have started out, like Martijn was saying, and you'll hear from Frank, and have become very successful because everything is growing here. No matter what kind of product that your company is manufacturing or representing, there is continuous growth. Even when times are not so good, like right now, the economy here is still growing. Um, the other segment I want to mention, because it's very significant for the future, are the startup and scale-up companies. Phoenix is a fantastic location for a so-called soft landing. Um, number one, the team here in Phoenix and in Tucson and other places in Arizona 
from the cities, from the regional government. They are here to help you and they have the time for that. Uh, California, wonderful, but take a number, stand in line. Uh, it's more expensive, et cetera, et cetera, more bureaucracy. So come to Arizona when you want to grow a business. And the areas that I think would be of interest when it comes to startup companies, I'm going to read from a list real quickly. Um, we're talking about uh, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, sensor technologies, autonomous driving, uh, photonics, all new technologies. Arizona is a leading market for those. And obviously, for that reason, highly attractive. Um, and perhaps later on, when we come back, we can also talk about opportunities for Arizona companies to use the Netherlands as their gateway to Europe. Multiple companies already do that, but there is future potential for that. So with that, I'll give it back to the moderator, uh, Deborah, and uh, I'd be happy to answer more, more questions. Thank you so much, Siba. And I'd like to add to that, I think um, there's definitely a lot of growth and opportunity in Arizona. Uh, we see Phoenix as the fifth biggest city of the US. We, um, but, but in addition to you know, all the resources you're listing and um, the support system for uh, startups and scale-ups, uh, let's not forget indeed, as Martin mentioned, the quality of life and also the astonishing nature if we're gonna make that comparison to California, that's the idea that many people have of California. But I would say in terms of nature, in terms of quality of life, um, definitely also go and explore Arizona. Um, with this, I'd like to give it to uh, Frank. Uh, Frank, um, what has your experience been like? How have you seen the business landscape evolve? And what has your, been your story as an entrepreneur in Arizona so far? And I think you'll have to unmute yourself, Frank. Anybody's interested in listening to me for sure. <laughs> um, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands, as uh, many of the people on the screen uh, today. Um, I've been in Arizona for 45 years by almost. And so uh, I remember fondly when some of you guys uh, graduated from high school. Um, but uh, in the, anyways, um, my background is technology. I uh, chemical engineering from the Netherlands uh, and electronics most of the time here. Uh, I had to landed a job when I came here to make the first computer disks. Uh, there was a, a whole new invention and everybody said, well, the disk is gonna replace the tape and tape is obsolete. And that was 50 years ago and we're still using it. So that's kind of, shows you how well we are capable of predicting how the future in the technology is going. Um, so um, I had the opportunity to start my own business <clears throat> two years after I came here um, and didn't particularly care for what I was uh, hired to do. So I started my own business and uh, uh, making test equipment for computer disk drives. And interestingly enough, I think 10 years later, we were considered to be the, the world's best provider of, uh, of uh, the high-tech high uh, test equipment in the world. And we had basically every disk drive manufacturer in the world as our client. So that shows you that indeed uh, Arizona is a fertile grounds for uh, new entrepreneurs and that you can indeed uh, get where you want to be. Um, the interesting thing that, for, that fascinated me, and that's why I have been working uh, since day one uh, with uh, uh, anybody that was interested in doing things with Europe, is that, um, and, and so, and provide technical support in many areas, working with Siva, uh, he was the, the business and diplomat guy, and I was the technology guy, and we both uh, worked on people like uh, ASU and all kinds of other things. And uh, Odette, I'm looking forward to, to support you in the same way as uh, I have been doing with Siba all these years. Um, what, what I find fascinating is uh, if you compare the Netherlands and Arizona, uh, you know, one is much larger than the other one, but much less than just densely populated. Um, the climates are completely diff different and, and mostly opposite, uh, very dry and very hot versus very wet and rather cold. And yet, when you make a list of, uh, of the, the, the which, which are the key industries in both, company, in both countries, they are exactly the same. We're talking about renewable energy and related development. We're talking about microbial, microbial and uh, algae, uh, bio, biology. Uh, we're talking about aerospace and aviation. We're talking about uh, business uh, software simulation techniques. 
military products, waste management, uh, agriculture, uh, high, uh, uh, water management, uh, as I said before, uh, advanced medical research, uh, and and food and so forth. So, although it doesn't make, uh, I guess maybe a first uh, ob observation. I think we might um, maybe deal with a technical issue. Am I the only one that has lost, Frank? No, he muted himself. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I did. Uh, oh, I, lost, I lost you again. So, so the other thing is uh, is uh, logistics and distribution. Uh, the Netherlands, as Sipa already said, is uh, is a fantastic opportunity to get into and use that as the gateway into the EU and, in fact, into EMEA and all the way to South Africa. Uh, Arizona is the in, you know the same kind of gateway into into the new uh, uh, USMCA, uh, the, the three countries that work together very well. And if you combine these two things, then you have an enormous opportunity to add. You know, we, we're focusing here on Arizona, mostly on, on Mexico and Canada. And I've been advocating for the last ten years that you need to have a third leg to that to that stool to make it more stable, and that's called the Netherlands. Because once you're in the Netherlands, uh, they do the rest for you. That is that is one of the most uh, underappreciated values that Holland offers. I think when once you're in there, you're on the on the mainland, and they do their own distribution for you all the way in all these other countries. So I probably need to leave it here, uh, but we can talk about it a lot more uh, whenever we have an opportunity. Thank you so much, Frank. And I think our Arizonian friends can also see now that the biggest. Uh, proponents and the biggest supporters of uh, doing trade in Arizona are definitely the Dutch entrepreneurs. <laughs> I think uh, we're definitely convinced about the opportunity of growth. Um, with regard to the time, um, I suggest that um, maybe at this point we open it up for a first round of questions and answers. If you have any questions you'd like to share, you can press the button, raise your hand so that I can get a notification and I can just give you the word. Uh, or you can also raise your hand manually uh, and I'll just scroll through the screen. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask to Martin, Siebe, or to uh, Frank, now is the time. Um, and in the meantime, I have tons. Um, I'd like to ask you all um, maybe as, as, as a wrap up then also, um, what what would be your key piece of advice to um, a Dutch ent or international entrepreneur in general that wants to do business, set up their business in Arizona at this point in time? What would be your um, key piece of advice? Uh, and if we can all limit it to uh, 30 seconds to one minute, as uh, short and snappy, that would be amazing. And I'll start with Martin. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, a lot of uh, actually spoken with a lot of startups and entrepreneurs that want to come to uh, to the to the West Coast, and uh, Silicon Valley or, or California is always very attractive. I would say to them, look at uh, Arizona as your opportunity to do everything you need to do on the on the West Coast without having to um, compete in the Silicon Valley market with uh, in terms of cost of setting up business and hiring people and managing offices and labs and so forth um, and use the resources that are available. Arizona is incredibly friendly to new businesses and, and offers a lot of opportunities. Reach out to uh, the GPEX and the mayor's offices and the other economic development organizations because they are there to help you and use your, your Dutch uh, connections. We are all here to help Dutch businesses, but also American businesses who are looking to go to the Netherlands. We're here to help you guys, gives you some insight, and we'd love to be able to uh, be part of that continued growth. Thank you so much, Martin. And um, I'd also like to offer to everyone um, dialing in from the Netherlands or who will be re-watching this again in the Netherlands because we will be, we will be, we will be distributing this uh, video there as well to definitely don't hesitate to reach out to uh, us at the consulate, to Odette Bakker as the honorary consul, or to be directly in touch with all of the people and entrepreneurs you have on this call today. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to welcome and help you. Uh, so thank you, Martin, for that perspective. Siebe, what would be your key, key piece of advice? Key piece of advice, come to Arizona. No, um, first of all, 
Um, I think as a Dutch entrepreneur coming to the United States for the first time, you have to realize this is a huge country. Uh, flying East Coast to West Coast takes six hours from Arizona, five hours. I don't think you can fly that long in Europe. Um, so understand the size of the country. Secondly, and I don't mean this, of course, in a negative way, but in the Netherlands, same for me, we grow up every day with information about the United States. We hear the American English language every single day. And if you do that until you're 25 or 30 years old, you actually feel that you know the United States. The reality is different. When you arrive here, you have to learn the culture, the way people do business, the way people communicate. The laws are different, obviously. So take your time. Don't say, oh, I know everything there is to know about the United States because I've been seeing it on TV for 20 years, but come out and experience that. And at the same time, back to Arizona, um, the, 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 the team, I wanna say the team, the city of Phoenix, GPEC, um, they are here to help, as Frank was saying as well, and Martijn also, they're here to help. So take advantage of that advice and the Dutch entrepreneurs that are here. Uh, I think without exception, we are here to help you as Dutch potential investors. So come to Arizona. Thank you, Siebe. I see a question popping up uh, asking for concrete examples of how GPEC has been helpful. I suggest we keep that for the uh, closing Q&A session, which will be a bit longer, so that we can actually also invite GPEC to react to that uh, after they've also been able uh, to take the word. So we'll definitely come back to your question. Thank you for asking it. And then I'll go to um, Frank, Frank, what would be your piece of advice to uh, Dutch companies uh, or international companies wanting to set up business in uh, Arizona? And if you could unmute yourself. Oh. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, okay, good. Um, well, uh, I mean, there are rules, uh, I guess, that apply in both directions. And the number one thought is uh, that you need to understand is that uh, trade and commerce are two-way streets. Uh, many times we have organizations that only focus on one and it doesn't work that way. Uh, you need to understand the other thing also. Many times if you want to export something, it is easier to find somebody that is willing, that you can have, a, that has a product that you can buy from and establish a relationship. And once the relationship is there, it is much easier to go in the other direction because now you are his customer instead of the other way around. Um, I think that you know, but the, other, the other thing is important, and again, it applies in both directions, is international business is just not legal contracts and regulations. That's what most people are, are, are focusing on, and that's what most of the, uh, the, the government agencies are able to provide, because that's pretty standard, and those are things they work with. Technology is a very, very important part because most of the stuff that is worth of exporting or importing is high tech these days. And unfortunately, uh, the, the technology world has, has moved at a space like a thousand times faster than everything else and has left everybody else in the, in, in the lurch. Uh, there is very little understanding in many non-technical areas about technology other than that it is uh, technology uh, pixie dust that you can sprinkle and everything and it solves all your problems. In reality, it doesn't work that way. And as technology advances and becomes more and more specialized, it is becoming more and more difficult for people to provide generic information that is helpful, other than what they just mentioned, uh, legal and regulations and, 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 and fi financial. So it's critically important that you align yourself with people in that other country that do have the ability to assist you um, on an, in, in a technology way also. You cannot assume that your product that is that is successful in your country is appealing to other people in other countries. It, it, it may not be at all because there are different values uh, in, in the regular world and different uh, things. Uh, and you know, don't forget that whatever is a good business practice in one country is considered stealing in another. So I it's not just agree. legal and there is a lot more to it than that. And I would align myself with the, te the technology groups that every country uh, has and see if you can get connections there. 
Thank you so much, Frank. I think that's very valuable uh, advice. Um, and I think that's exactly what we're looking for as well. Um, you know, offering that international perspective and that guidance, working together very closely with local partners, both from the policy, but also from the entrepreneurial side. Um, I will now be very happy to transfer the word and the moderation to Odette Bakke, a newly appointed uh, honorary council of the Netherlands in Arizona to moderate the second part of the session, a policy dialogue. Um, Odette, take it away. Thank you, Deborah. Well, um, thank you everybody for welcoming me and I'm very proud and honored that I am the new honorary council for the Netherlands. Um, to everybody, if in a normal situation, I would have gone out of my way to meet you with each and every one of you face-to-face, uh, -face, but we're in a virtual world these days. So feel free to reach out to me and feel free to introduce yourself. And I'll make sure that I chase some of you to make sure that we get connected and get to know each other. So um, with that, um, I'd like to introduce two superstars here in the greater Phoenix area who know everything about international trade. Uh, Christine Mackey from the city of Phoenix. She's the director of community and economic development and um, has lots of experience. And then Chris Camacho from GPAC, um, who is the CEO and president of GPAC, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. Uh, we really are excited to hear more about your uh, ideas, your experience, your advice, and what's uh, to come. So with that, I would like to ask the first question to both of you, and then I will ask Christine Mackey to answer the question first and then to Chris Camacho. Uh, looking back at the past trade um, successes that we've had over the last couple of years, could you elaborate a little bit more? What stood out to you uh, as far as the collaboration between the Netherlands and the state of Arizona or the Netherlands and Phoenix and uh, what has been your experience? Chris, Christine Mackey, go, go ahead. Odette, thank you for that. And thanks very much for having me here this morning and congratulations on your new appointment. It's, it's wonderful to have you with the city of Phoenix as the consul, uh, honorary consul for the Netherlands. We'll do a lot of business together. Uh, so um, pre-pandemic, the mayor did have a, a trade delegation that she was taking to the Netherlands. It was very well planned and very well set. And then of course, with the pandemic that was canceled and we're very, very hopeful that we'll have a vaccine in the near future and she'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to go with her on a trade delegation to the Netherlands. So we have had, um, I, would, I would speak very highly of the relationship that we have with the Netherlands and with our trade partners and opportunities that have happened together. Of course, as you can imagine, we work very closely with Philips. Uh, they are a great Phoenix company. Uh, and with Phoenix having such a heavy focus on biosciences and healthcare, Philips is an incredible partner and a great gateway for us into the Netherlands. Uh, they have been working very closely with us on looking at some very unique opportunities to bring entrepreneurship, um, uh, biosciences, healthcare, and entrepreneurship. We strive to be what the Netherlands is in, in biosciences, healthcare, entrepreneurship, and startup companies. And you all are world renowned for the activities that you have in, in the medical field on, on that front. So uh, we've been working very closely with them and have some things that we are, are working towards. When we look at semiconductor and electronics, of course, Phoenix is well known and, and well versed in that front. That's something that we've been working in you know, kind of just following World War II when we work to modify our economy and have continued to move forward there. You know, and for those of you that don't know, I was Chandler's economic developer for 16 years and ASML is its headquarters in Chandler. So I had worked very closely with them for quite an extensive period of time. And as we look at, at specifics and how we can all work together, I'd love to see us continuing the conversation and looking for creative ways to get our startup companies to partner with each other, to be able to leverage what's here, whether it is our startup companies going to the Netherlands or, or your early stage companies coming to Phoenix. There's so many things that we can do together. And, and I know there's other questions coming in the future. So I'll turn it over to Chris instead of hogging the mic for the entire time. Chris. 
Well, great. Thank you, Chris. And, and thanks, uh, Odette, for the opportunity. Great to see you. Great to see a lot of the familiar faces that we've known and uh, enjoyed working with Siba and Frank and so many others that have just enhanced the relationship between the Netherlands and Arizona and, and Phoenix uh, region specifically. Well, since Chris uh, did such a great job illuminating the trade and vertical sectors, I'm just going to talk about uh, soccer today, European football. I see that uh, uh, both Robin uh, and, and Wesley Snyder coming back. I mean, I don't know what that kind of news is, but they're coming back to play again, uh, as I've heard. So great news. And, and I was growing up, I was, Robin too? Robin, yeah, I was a big uh, Van Easteroy fan. So, yeah, you've produced a lot of talent there, you know, beyond, uh, you know, beyond all the great technology that you produce as well. Um, as Chris talked about, I'll just mention a few additional items. You know, the, uh, she mentioned uh, ASML, uh, also ASM and NXP and so many other semiconductor supply chain companies have really anchored in Greater Phoenix and have uh, put us on the map as the top four uh, in, in the U.S. market for semiconductors. And in this new age of Industry 4.0, where you have connected devices and smart city strategies, the bedrock of, of that sector overall is being able to produce uh, advanced chips, transistors, and other technologies that meet the needs of consumers. And we're in a very fortuitous spot where we have a, a long-standing, almost 40-year 40 40 year run now of producing semiconductors that uh, I'm confident are going to yield to the next generation of everything from 5G to emerging automotive. And in our pipeline today, there's over 200 plus companies from around the world that are looking at Greater Phoenix for investment opportunities. And uh, in part where, you know, the last, uh, last few years under SEBA's guidance, we've spent time, uh, you know, back and forth to the Netherlands. And uh, one of the things that always struck me going there was the, the federal or, or country strategy tied to turnaround industries, whether they were, you know, looking at energy or looking at, um, you know, the bio sector, the neuroscience capabilities of the Dutch market. And we're, we're constantly trying to find ways, as Chris alluded to, to enhance the, the ongoing investment and trade relationship where, you know, today, you know, the, the Netherlands do about, uh, we export about $800 million a year of product. And a lot of that's semiconductor, a lot of that's other materials related to that sector. But I think in this increasing kind of new era of digitization, we want to do a better job as the United States of creating uh, not only physical landing spaces, like, like one example would be the Global Growth Accelerator, whereby you know, we've worked with a lot of our in-region leadership to create physical locations. And this one in particular, the Global Growth Accelerator is anchored to uh, ASU Skysong, which is one of the innovation campuses here. And then region-wide, there's a number of other locations that welcome foreign-owned enterprises is they want to establish Greater Phoenix as the beachhead. And we provide, you know, free space, uh, work to provide, again, with a lot of our partners, this kind of ecosystem support. So if it's your first time uh, launching your, your product to the U.S., so everything from legal to real estate to accounting, tax, all the service infrastructure that you might need to invest in the U.S., these are the kind of mechanisms that, that we try to put in place to support uh, your, your needs as you grow and scale in, in Arizona. Um, I also serve on Secretary Ross of so the U.S. Secretary of Commerce he has an International Advisory Council. And I serve on, on this council for uh, the U.S. Commerce Secretary where we look at everything from tariffs to visas. And I will tell you, this is a really interesting time for our country and how we're treating L1 visas, the new strategies around lotteries, dealing with the State Department, um, you know, we have a very significant uh, challenge ahead of us as we're trying to ensure that commerce can flow fr uh, freely, but also people can fro uh, flow freely and ideas can be brought to the U.S. and expanded in the U.S. because that's a very important aspect of our innovation culture. So we just really respect the longstanding history we've had. Uh, overwhelmingly, year after year, the, the Dutch market comes in number one sure it's been said before today, uh, but number one in foreign direct investment for the U.S. As all of us that are kind of pro-Arizona, we want to gain, gain more of our fair share of that uh, foreign direct investment coming from the Netherlands to Arizona. And then 
uh, inversely, we want to do what we can to help our Arizona-based companies grow and scale in the Dutch market. And the last trip we had to Maastricht and Eindhoven and other locations, you saw on the ground the repositioning of the innovation assets in those communities. And I was just blown away being someone who's close to that for the last 20 years. So uh, anyway, thanks for the opportunity to speak a little bit on that topic and, uh, and, and back to you, Odette. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, my second question is pretty much uh, in alignment with that. To both of you, looking back and now looking to the future, and uh, as we touched on some of those uh, really strong suits of the, the Dutch, like the innovation and the semiconductors and the circular economy and uh, e-mobility e and smart mobility, where do you, either both of you see the biggest opportunity looking forward Maybe we can hone in on one or two industries where we really see the biggest potential uh, for this collaboration between the Netherlands and Arizona. Uh, yeah. Chris yeah, thanks, Odette. So, um, as you as you well know, uh, Phoenix has a tremendous focus on the circular economy. I have a team member that's in economic development, and I think we're the only city in the region that has this. That his focus is on food innovation systems and the circular economy. And that's all he focuses on. So um, I think, and as we've looked at, I think, you know, the Netherlands leads the globe in the circular economy activities that are done. So I think that is a great place for us to partner and to look at creative and cooperative opportunities. It is extremely important to the mayor and council uh, and, and quite frankly, to our citizens. We've got to create a world in which we're all going to survive 100 years from now or 200 years from now. And without the activities that we focus on in the circular economy. Um, you may or may not know, we have a, a circular economy campus called Risen. It's a resource innovation a network campus that's a former landfill. And we locate companies there that, that work in the circular economy. We've got some that are taking old mattresses and turning them into dog beds. We've got things, you know, we've got companies that are, are uh, taking palm fronds and turning them into pet food. Uh, it is, it's really exciting stuff that's going on there. So I think in, a, in, in looking at how we could work closely together on the circular economy would probably be one of our strongest fronts. And while on the Netherlands side, you're, the science and sustainability is extremely important. We've got a plan for a zero carbon footprint in the city by 2040. So we're working diligently on our climate activities and, and things as we move forward and plan on, on running some competitions for our early stage companies on sustainability and circular economy. So I think those could be two more innovative uh, areas in which we could work together closely with our companies, but also, and I'll, I'll always go back to, because of course it's my pet and my favorite is on the biosciences and healthcare front, is to, to come up with those world changing revolutionary medicines and in enhancing lives and in, in practices together where we could partner. So uh, really would look forward to continuing the conversation on the circular economy. Thank you, Chris. Chris Camacho. Sure, I'll just add two more quick uh, areas of focus because I agree with Chris and the, the kind of foundation that's been laid around the circular economy is what uh, the city has been heavily focused on along with a number of private sector partners. But um, I would also say the two other that come to mind is, is the neuroscience sector. When I look at the capabilities of the Dutch universities in, in applied research, as well as entrepreneurs, coupled with our uh, a number of efforts underway in, in Phoenix, uh, we are emerging as one of the top hubs in that uh, the neuroscience area. And a lot of that's Barrow's Neurological Institute driven. Uh, but you also have various elements of that supply chain being built. So in the heart of Phoenix that, that Chris uh, overseas, kind of the main central spine of the city, which is called Central Avenue, you've seen a massive renaissance in, in uh, the north central aspect of our community where you have anchored with uh, Barrels Neurological Institute, Creighton University, and, and a number of other uh, capabilities that are in that ecosystem right in the heart of the city, along with uh, what we stood up a couple years ago with the support of the mayor and, and uh, other leaders in the region is a wearable technology institute with the whole premise of being able to shift intellectual property I, I, you know, ideation or ideas that were coming from docs at Barrow's Neurological Institute into new med devices that could be quickly vetted, tested, uh, and then, you know, funded with the idea of taking that to commercial applications. So we try to make it, you know, from a brand perspective, 
Greater Phoenix and Arizona are known as being very pro-business, very entrepreneurial minded, but also very collaborative. So you'd see hospitals, you would see researchers, unlike other places where I've worked, I mean, this is a very open place that welcomes newcomers. And so I think that that's definitely an area, Chris mentioned biosciences, but right down the street, you have also one of the top REITs in the United States, Real Estate Investment Trust is building one of the most premier class A office and lab space facilities uh, with Wexford. So again, a lot of capability there. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, this kind of next terrain, which is going to be heavily focused on how cities deploy and utilize smart technologies, which I know is uh, something close to what, what I've observed in a number of regions in the, the Netherlands, is we stood up what's called the, the smart region uh, collaborative or, or called the connective, where you have 22 cities in the metro region, their CIOs working together with Arizona State University, their 24,000 uh, engineers within the engineering school are focused on how do we deploy smart technology to the benefit of our communities. So we have innovation challenges. We have a number of different, if I had more time, I'd talk about it today, but smart cities, our whole mindset is how do we do that at scale? How do we look at procurement at scale? How do we uh, create the governance structure whereby uh, cities work together, they talk to one another. Uh, so these 4.8 million people that live in the region uh, believe it or not, our cities actually work together, unlike other places I've been where they may smile and say they work together and then go, you know, don't work together when they're behind closed doors. Our cities actually do that. So if I leave you with nothing else today, I would hope that, you know, we'd have a chance to visit with you at some point in the near future face to face or maybe face to compu computer if this is going to be, uh, you know, what we see for the for the time being. But we really try to sit on your side of the table and be your partner. Uh, if you're looking at investing in the U.S. or you're trying to find a partner in the U.S., try to find a distribution channel in the U.S., those are all things that we can assist with. Well, in Odette, it's Chris. If I could just add on to what Camacho was just saying, as an example, you cities collect incredible data, and we don't always know what to do with that data. So we might collect our data from transit. We collect police data. We collect homeless data. We collect all this data, and then it kind of sits on a shelf. Um, and so we've been leveraging, to Camacho's point, we've been leveraging that data and getting it out into our early stage companies to be able to say to them, what would you do with this data? How would you solve some of the problems that we're facing? Um, and it can be things as simple as, you know, when the trains run and how many, how long the doors are open and when people get off and on and, and things like that that happen. So um, to Chris's point, you know, cities don't always talk to each other. We get so busy focused on running a city, but I would say that under, you know, under that smart cities initiative that we're, we're all working towards sharing that data that can ad not only advance our cities on a smart city side, but drive those new next new technology and technology based companies to change the lives of our citizens every day is something under Camacho's leadership that we're all working towards. Thank you, Chris. Um, so we're, we're getting toward the time of our discussion where we have some room for Q and A's and uh, feel free to send the Q and A in the chat or raise your hand so we can uh, ask your question. But let's start with the question that Lydia McLean uh, asked earlier and I don't know, it said, um, Pam Martin or someone else give an example of how GPAC has assisted in the entrepreneurial efforts. And this is also really because we're videotaping this session for other entrepreneurs um, that will review this video later on, like uh, good to know. And I would like to extend the same question to Chris Mackey, uh, like to hear and, and to, to hear from either Frank or Siva or Martin, how these organizations have been able to help in their own entrepreneurship. I will give it to Martin first. Thank sure, you, Odette. So, go ahead. Thank you, Odette. Um, yeah, as I, as I said earlier in my introduction, um, I wish I had known the resources that had been available to me when I did move my move to Arizona to set up a business. So I probably wouldn't be the best person to answer and I don't want to take too much airtime. So I'm going to pass it on to my uh, colleagues. Well, maybe if I can uh, jump in a little bit. Um, I've been so long in Arizona. I've been here since before GPEC. What can I say, Chris? Um, but 
what I do know from experience, not only myself, but from other foreign companies, Dutch companies, that when you come to Phoenix, there is a team of people ready to, let's say, hold your hand, but guide you through your questions. And it is an outstanding track record that uh, GPEG has, the city of Phoenix as well, in assisting companies, depending on their industry, depending on what they're looking for, uh, the services from GPEG reach very, very far. And most of it, as far as I know, is at no cost. Dutch people like that, and um, uh, but very detailed. So research in terms of industries, um, facilitating connections to people and companies. Um, and as Chris just was saying, and I know we all agree, those of us here in Arizona, we work as a team. And it's truly interesting, GPEC means the Greater Phoenix Economic Council. So that is the city of Phoenix, the biggest city, but surrounding cities. I think, I wanna say 22, but I'm sure there's a more exact number. Um, we all work together. And I say we, because GPEC also includes foreign companies, foreign nationals as part of their team. So that kind of assistance at no cost, I think is extremely relevant and helpful. Yeah, just, just what I would add, see, because I, I was about to write in the chat, I think you could do my job because you do a great job uh, framing the region. Uh, you know, it is the fastest growing market in the United States. And what we pride ourselves on is truly being not only a partner, but a, a due diligence data arm of new companies evaluating the market. So you'd be amazed the, think of like a McKinsey or a Deloitte or a KPMG capable team that would help you look at tax, cost, real estate, cost of living, all these indexes that, that a foreign company would analyze coupled with distribution channels, supply chain, procurement. We, we try to, like Seba said, be a, a strong partner as foreign companies are trying to figure out the U.S. consumer market. And so I've got a team, we're, we're a, a team of 30 in total on our staff at Greater Phoenix Economic Council. And then we coordinate with all 22 cities, Chris's uh, community being the largest. And so whatever you would need from the region, we try to be your single point of contact. And I see Cam on our side and Mitchell Allen's on the, on the line here too. We have a, a lot of folks here, you know, ready and willing to help you through that process. And a lot of our foreign companies in the last decade have, have looked to launch in the U.S. through a, J, a JV. And so, you know, not only will we help on the due diligence side, but we can help identify partners that might make sense for you to launch your U.S. consumer product. Thank you, Chris. Another question came in, uh, is very actual and very uh, to the point for now, we're moving through. Um, for both Chris and Chris, um, the COVID-19 has had an impact on our economy. And um, of course, we get questions about that too from Dutch entrepreneurs or from people around. But to you, which sector has been the most vulnerable in this season? which sector has been the most robust and how can we work together to support these businesses in this uh, time of need? Chris Camacho is, um, is making gestures. So Chris, go ahead. Camacho. Yeah. Yeah. So regionally, obviously that we're, we're a, a very strong tourism location. And when COVID hit in March, really almost October through about April is our, tourist season. A lot, a lot of people love to come to Arizona during that time. And so uh, certainly tourism, hospitality, retail, and restaurants were the four sectors hit most significantly. And uh, unlike, you know, I guess I should say similarly to other places in the U.S. that have high tourism numbers, uh, all the markets were hit in similar fashion. It just so happens that when this did hit uh, more notoriously in, in March, April, May, that comes off the heels of our spring training where we have half of the major league baseball teams here and uh, a lot of occupancy. It's tough to find a hotel room in February, March, and April in, in Phoenix, just because it's in such demand. So um, those were the sectors hit, hit the most significant. They are coming back uh, now that we've been able to slowly reopen thoughtfully. We are seeing you know, some recovery there, but the U.S. is going to continue to struggle uh, as we've seen very high COVID numbers across the U.S. Uh, some of the more resilient from a jobs perspective sectors have been healthcare. So healthcare obviously uh, has, has continued to grow as a percentage against the uh, total output, uh, as has uh, professional services. 
And so we're seeing those two sectors still add job growth as we've seen the rest of the U.S. economy contract. And uh, it still remains to be seen with, you know, I know we, we ship a lot of product from Freeport McMoran and other major, you know, mainstay Arizona companies. Um, but, you know, we're, we're seeing right now, we're still in the midst of the pandemic here in the U.S. And so we're working very diligently to help small business at this time, because those are the, the most impacted are these locally owned small businesses that don't have the cash buffer that the, the enterprise companies might have. And so that's probably been our most significant focus in the last quarter has been, you know, not only leveraging the congressional dollars so that that the couple trillion dollars that the U.S. Congress provided, but there's so much work still to be done to help small business get through this uh, challenging time. Holy, thank you so much, Chris. Chris Mackey. Yeah, so I, I dovetail on what Chris was saying. Of course, tourism was our most fragile in April, some of our hotels were reporting an occupancy rate of 1.8%, less than 2% when they're normally, in April, they'd normally be in the 80 and 90% range. Um, I chatted with a bunch of them yesterday in some of the calls I was making, and most of them that are open are now back up to 30 and 40% occupancy. So even though it's still, you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, the occupancy rates are actually coming back in some of our hotels. So that's, that's good news for us. I think that's indicative of our own citizens who are doing staycations as opposed to, you know, going to LA or, or flying overseas or something. So we see a lot of that. Um, our restaurants were, were really challenged. We've already lost 9% of our restaurants. They're not reopening again. So that is almost one out of every 10 that's, that's just closing their doors. And so that is, is another area we're challenged. And on the retail front, in, in May, you saw about 40% of the retail tenants pay their rent. Um, and so the pandemic has really exacerbated some retailers that would probably have closed in the next three to five years. It just sped it up. And now they're either going to just an online presence. But uh, you know, to Chris's point, healthcare has been a huge push for us. Coming out of the Great Recession, you know, pre-Great Recession, you would have seen that construction would have been the leading indicator coming out of, of a recession. Um, you know, getting back to home building, we're an economy that for decades and decades had really been built on growth. And the great thing coming out of, of the Great Recession is it wasn't construction jobs leading the way, it was healthcare jobs. And healthcare jobs have dwarfed the increase in construction jobs. So in Phoenix alone and, and in Phoenix proper, we see about 4.4 uh, 4 million square feet at $3.5 billion of new capital investment and 7,000 jobs under construction right now. So, uh, you know, the other that we're seeing really leading coming out of it uh, uh, are our manufacturing companies. We're seeing onshoring happening again. People that kind of lost their, their products during the pandemic are now really coming back to Phoenix. Mitchell and I, uh, you know, if you've not met Mitchell Allen, one of the best industrial specialists in the business and, and you know, can connect you to anybody. And Mitchell's doing an incredible job with GPAC in bringing those manufacturing uh, manufacturers back. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. That's so good to hear. I believe uh, Martine has a question. You can unmute yourself, Martine. Yeah, no, actually, I, I just wanted to have an opportunity to kind of, um, you know, we're talking about the impact of COVID-19 COVID here, and I wanted to kind of bring some counterpoints here as well in the sense that impact is not all negative. Um, the innovation that we, well, the Dutch are entrepreneurs, as we all know. Arizona is a state of uh, technology, life science, biotech, uh, and, uh, and, and renewables. And um, this, this pandemic has also op uh, offered a lot of opportunities. And a lot of entrepreneurs are looking at how you can pivot and how you can actually benefit from this. I know Drew is, uh, used, uh, Drew DeWert, he was always on here with his company, Multitable, started making plexiglass um, dividers and things like that to, to pivot his business. Um, clients of mine, I work in the tech space, mostly uh, semiconductor and high tech. Uh, I have clients who are starting to now make um, air handling systems that are uh, cleaning air for back to work opportunities. Um, we've seen Honeywell pivot. You know, we've seen so many things happen in Arizona and I've seen it also with a lot of um, uh, Dutch entrepreneurship um, that are just looking at these types of times of difficulty to pivot and to make something happen and to actually come up with new technologies and quickly turn that around and make something happen. And so 
Um, you know, in times of, of difficulty, it, there's also a lot of opportunity out there. And I wanted to show that, you know, specifically uh, the Dutch as well as the, uh, the uh, um, Arizona um, business climate really is, uh, is very well suited to actually benefit from this and to build new businesses and new opportunities going forward. And Martijn, that's exactly where we can be helpful to our entrepreneurs and to our, our small companies is as they pivot and they need connections to hospitals or they need connections to vendors. Those are things that we've been doing. We do it on a normal basis, but particularly now when somebody's got this great concept that was great and they need to run their proof of concept by someone, that's what we're here for. Chris and I and our teams can make those connections to anyone that they need. To your point, we had a, a small company here that they manufactured trade show booths. That was their, that was their job. Uh, and as you can imagine, nobody's buying a trade show booth right now. Instead, they pivoted and now they're manufacturing a ventilator protector. So it's a plastic box that goes over the ventilator for when they pull out the tube so that it doesn't spew all, all over. And we're always able to help those companies get connections with hospitals and, and manufacturing. So thanks for that on the entrepreneur side and we're here to help any way we can. I have, thank you, Chris. I have one final question uh, posed by Melissa Sanderson. Uh, can our speakers address the advantages Arizona offers to Dutch investors to take advantage of the USMCA by investing in Arizona? Um, for, and after answering our question, we're gonna um, wrap it up almost and get to our mixer. So uh, Christine and uh, Chris, do you have uh, an answer to Melissa's question? We can choose who can start first. Camacho, why don't you go first? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be brief on this, but Mel, thanks for bringing that up because I know you deserve a lot of credit with uh, the leadership and the state focused on USMCA as the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, which provides uh, a focus on free and fair trade as an upgrade or an update in modernizing uh, the North American free trade agreement from the 80s. And there's so many specific new provisions in uh, that law and that trade agreement that uh, encourage uh, you know, trilateral opportunities for the U.S. market. And what I, what I believe this does for European uh, opportunities for the U.S. Um, or North America, for that matter, is it further propels a, a signal between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. that not only are we open for business and we're going to work together, but there's a clarity around uh, licensing, clarity around protection of intellectual property, protection around uh, the worker. And this, this modernized USMCA, in my mind, I, I hope it becomes kind of the, the signature way that the U.S. will approach a trade agreements. And as many of you know, in the last few years, we've attempted to do this with other countries to no avail. And so, you know, for, for the United States, Canada, and Mexico to get on the same page um, is very important because obviously you're, it's better to have your neighbors as friends. And uh, we're gonna continue to work with Canada and Mexico as we go forward. But those are some of the examples where we think this is gonna continue to open up markets, everything from uh, lumber imports to uh, the way that US and Mexico manufacturing, particularly in the automotive supply chain and aerospace supply chains, it's gonna further fortify the North American uh, competitive position. And Odette, I would completely agree with Chris and, and in the interest of time, probably don't have much more to add than that. I have one more short question uh, that one of the entrepreneurs is asking, um, how far does uh, GPAC's reach reach? Does it also uh, serve as the Tucson area or is there a GPAC version in Tucson? Yeah, so there is a group in uh, Tucson, my counterparts called the Sun Corridor uh, organization, and uh, they, they represent more of Pima County and that kind of, uh, that area down in Tucson. Our geographic boundaries are the Metro Phoenix, uh, really the metropolitan statistical area. So that 4.8 million people in and around Metro Phoenix, but we work together with, if, if anyone had an interest in any part of our state, We'll coordinate with our counterparts in the governor's office and and or our Tucson friends or Yuma or Flagstaff. So we're very you know coordinated with how we do this work, and so I'm happy to help anyone that that needs support. Thank you so much, Chris.
And before we hand it back to Deborah, I would like to give Vincent Stormans the opportunity to say a few words. Go ahead, Vincent. Just very briefly, Odette, because I, I just want to share with this group that I'm so happy how this is turning out, this, this uh, webinar, this roundtable. Uh, as our speakers, both Chris, Chris Mackey and Chris Camacho, also Martijn, Sieber, Frank have been so very specific in what they're sharing with us. Because indeed, normally uh, under regular circumstances, we, we would have met up in a beautiful uh, hotel as in, in downtown Phoenix or in Chandler uh, or in Scottsdale. But now uh, COVID forces us to do it online. But that also allows us, uh, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to the specificity, uh, specificity of the uh, speakers, we can share what they have been uh, telling us with Dutch entrepreneurs. And that is exactly what we'll be doing. So uh, as you know, this will be uh, taped and we can go to those uh, entrepreneurs in the uh, neuroscience sector or the circular economy uh, that, that Chris spoke to or the, the food innovation sector and share what, uh, what Phoenix uh, and what Arizona has to offer. So I, I just wanted to share with you that you have all been part of a big uh, Arizona commercial, I would say. Uh, and we will be making sure that this uh, message reaches the Netherlands. So that was just uh, an observation from my end. Thank you so much, Vincent. And I think for, with that, I would like to thank the speakers of this particular part of the session, Christine Mackey and Chris Camacho. And I will uh, thank you for your wisdom and for your experience. And uh, I would like to hand it back to Deborah for what our next steps are with this particular virtual gathering. Thank you so much, Odette. Uh, the idea of this gathering is to be interactive, to be learning from each other. So therefore we have a small surprise. We will now uh, mix you all in a little social mixer. If you'd like to participate in that, you will see a pop-up appearing on your screen. You will get the notification that you will be assigned to a breakout room. If you click OK, you will be transferred there immediately. Um, if you don't click it, you will remain in the uh, main space. Uh, and then Milena, our uh, wonderful technical um, expert, will help you get to your group uh, accordingly. And after that, we'll come back for some last words. Okay, well, thank you so much. I hope you had very enriching conversations in your breakout rooms. Mine was uh, very interesting. I can say we exchanged some email addresses uh, for further follow-up. So I hope uh, your group was as productive. If you'd like to be put in touch with someone that participated in this round that you couldn't get the email address from, please just do let us know. Uh, there's multiple ways to reach us. Um, I'll also um, make sure to send a follow-up email to all of you that have registered uh, with extra contact details and we'll be happy to put you in touch with each other. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if you have any further follow-up points uh, or ideas for further collaboration, we'd love to be in touch with you. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna let you enjoy a wonderful sunny uh, day in Arizona and a wonderful summer night in the Netherlands. Thank you so much.